Uh, my name is Jimmy Lamb. I'm with Sawgrass Technologies, but my background goes way back beyond that. Just a quick introduction about who I am. Um, I've been involved in the decoration industry, for lack of a better term, decoration. We try to use one word to cover everything, and it's not really possible. Um, and the problem with that, too, when you tell people you're in the decoration industry, they, they think you do Christmas trees or birthday cakes. Um, all right, well, you know, when I was 16, I worked at Baskin Robbins, and I did birthday cakes, so there. Um, but uh, I've been involved with the decoration industry for, uh, you know, well over 20 years, but I hate to say that because it makes me sound old. So I remind people that maybe I've done it for 20 years, but I started when I was five. Okay, so that makes me feel better anyway. Uh, but I actually got my start as, as an embroiderer, or, or, you know, embroidery, embro that's a tough word to actually say, especially when you tell me I'm an embroiderer, or, 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 because it kind of doesn't want to end, that word. So we were trying to work a way around it, and we, we decided we'd say, well, we're su uh, su uh, sewers. But, you know, sewer spelled like sewer, you know, so that didn't work either. So then we try the decorator thing, whatever. The best thing you can possibly do is to wear something you've done. When people say, what do you do? You point at it, okay? So if it's embroidery, then they can see it. Because they call embroidery all kinds of things, and same with sublimation, and the same with rhinestones engraving. I mean, there's lots of weird terminology for what it is we do. So it's a little hard to explain. But got my start, like I said, you know, a few years ago uh, as an embroiderer and uh, grew my business and did a lot of work, especially with apparel. And then it gradually worked my way into some other, other types of decoration, okay? Including things like, you know, digital processes. So I got a pretty varied background, and you're going to hear a lot about it as we go through. Um, also, I am from the South. That's good, because when I'm here, you guys can understand me, okay? As opposed to, like, New York City, where people are like, what did he say? So uh, here we shouldn't have that problem, I don't think. So, uh, but if we do have the problem, raise your hand, and I'll spell the word for you, because, you know, us Southerners, we have some interesting versions of things. So we're going to start out talking about sublimating apparel, apparel being one of my favorite categories of all. And uh, what I'm going to do is initially kind of walk you through the basic process and show you how easy it is and then point out where all the challenges are, okay, on the second pass. And then we're actually going to bring Sean back up and put him back to work and we're going to press something for you. And if it all goes right, it'll look good. And if it goes wrong, we'll be doing a session on troubleshooting your mistakes, okay? <laughs> And we're good at that. And we'll have him edit that out just in case. Okay. So full color sublimated apparel is, is hot, okay? Well, actually, the old polyester really was hot, but the new poly is much better, okay? Uh, of all of you in here, does anybody screen print? Okay, we got some screen printers. Uh, embroiders. Okay, we got some embroiders. Uh, DTG. Yeah, we got some DTG. And, and how many are actually sublimating now? And of those of you who are sublimating, how, how many of you are doing apparel and how many are doing apparel well? Okay, that's, that's good. Okay, that, that's not bad. All right. So, uh, you know, when we start looking at being able to do apparel, uh, traditionally what's done with screen printing, and screen printing has a, a lot of limitations. You can do some great stuff, but when you start talking about setups, it's ridiculous. And the beauty of the digital process is they've improved so much that we can do fantastic work in any variation of color in theory that we want. You know, a screen printer is limited by his equipment as to how much color he can apply, but we within reason, as long as it fits the color gamut. You talk about color gamuts, where do you go? You talk about color gamuts, or is that a new word? Uh, briefly, I think. Okay, just I'm throwing those words out there. Uh, but depending on the gamut range, you know, you can do pretty much any kind of color that you want. We're finding a lot of trends out there right now, and a part of it's the economy. With the economy, nobody wants to spend any money, okay? So we have to work harder to get that money. Uh, but because of that, two things are very predominant. Number one, people are ordering in smaller quantities because they're just trying to hold on to their money and they're just letting it come out a little bit slower. They're also wanting it when? Five minutes ago, now, okay? And that's been a big change too because people want it right now, which means on-demand printing, which is a very important phrase to keep in mind because especially when you're out selling and you're talking and maybe going up against people, their screen printers, for example, you know, sublimation is a great on-demand process. I mean, if you have the artwork, you can produce it in just a matter of minutes. As opposed to someone that's doing screen printing, they have to do all their setups and burn screens, and it's just, a, it can be all day setting up to do one job. So sublimation has taken us a long way. Now, one of the big limiting factors for so many years was the polyester aspect, because the reality of polyester apparel was, well, 
Nobody wanted it, okay? Um, now, I'm not old enough to remember John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever and that age, okay? But I heard about it, saw it on TV land. And, uh, you know, back in those days, we had the, the leisure suits and these uh, pseudo silk shirts that were really polyester. And they were, what, hot, icky, and sticky, okay? Now, a lot of people still remember that one. So when you're out there selling your products and you start talking about, you know, being able to do polyester apparel, you got to be very careful because there's a lot of people instantly in their head, you say polyester, they're like, I'm out of here, okay? Because they don't understand. In fact, most people, not including you guys, because you guys have a much better knowledge of what's going on, most people out there, when you say the word polyester, they think of something like this, okay? Sir, expert that you are, how about touch and feel and tell me what does that feel like to you? An Under Armour shirt. No, 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 no. That's way too much information. We want a one word answer. Polyester, thank you. Okay, let's work with this side over here. Ma'am, take this shirt here, hold it for a minute, feel it, tell everybody what it feels like to you, the material that it's made of. What do you feel like it, it's made of? Polyester. Polyester, thank you. Okay, all right. Let's try down here just to get another opinion. Um, but you got a nice big smile there. Ma'am, try that out. Tell me what you think. What does it feel like? Polyester. Thank you. One word answers are good. Don't look at the label. Okay. All right, so our panel of experts so far have said that this looks, feels like polyester, and they are 100% correct. This is 100% polyester. You can pass around in case someone's ever seen it or they don't believe what they had to say. Okay, the next item up here in our bag of magic tricks is yet another t-shirt. Now, again, I'm looking for one-word answers. I don't want dissertations. I'm not sure I trust you at this point. Okay, take this shirt, feel it, and tell everybody what that feels like to you initially. Thank you. He learns good. Okay, ma'am, opposing opinion, what do you think? Thank you. She said cotton, okay, and we'll go to our third expert here, and what do you think? Don't look at the label. Thank you, cotton, okay. All three of our esteemed panel of experts, quit, that's enough, okay, have said that this looks and feels like cotton, and it does look and feel like cotton, okay? And the reality is this is 100% polyester also. Now, I know from your experience, when you really see, here's the danger. When I hand this to people that are experienced with shirts, they really want to dissect it. Well, this feels kind of like maybe an 80-20 blend, and then it goes on and on. Bottom line, though, is your customer will find this feels like a cotton shirt. Looks feels like cotton, okay? Cotton is still king, or at least people think that it is, but the reality is pretty amazing is that, well, you know what it feels like, that we now have 100% polyester products that have the look and feel of cotton. So that opens up the doors to you. Because when we go to sublimate, sublimation only bonds molecularly with polyester fibers, okay? It does not bond to cotton. It may artificially adhere to cotton, but once you go and wash it, it's not going to be there very long, okay? Because it does not chemically work with cotton, only with polyester. So now if you're out there selling, you actually have some variety in that you can do. One of the things you've got to be careful with is polyester shirts do cost more money, or at least good quality ones do especially poly performance, okay? Just because it's polyester doesn't mean it's performance. Performance means that it's been manufactured such that it has breathability, or as he was saying, Under Armour, great reference point, Under Armour, because Under Armour is the one who's become a household name of breathability. So when we're talking about performance apparel, it looks and feels like cotton or poly, depending on which way you wanna go. But the key with performance is breathability. In the summer, it's cooler to wear, because it wicks the moisture away from our skin, and in the winter, it's warmer to wear for that same purpose. Costs a little bit more money, though. So you wanna make sure that you don't call that a T-shirt, okay? Because if, you, because if you say the word T-shirt, most people have a perception of they went to the beach somewhere, and they saw the T-shirt shop where you can get five T-shirts for $8, okay? So their perception of the word T-shirt is low value, low-end merchandise. So you gotta be careful that you don't build that as a T-shirt, you always build it as performance wear. Now, the Under Armour connection is very important too because everything we do with pricing, pricing is not about being the cheapest. It's not even about the market. It's about the perception of the customer. If the customer thinks it's worth that, it is worth that unless you can convince them otherwise, okay? Your job in the world of pricing is to raise their perception of value to your perception of what that value is. In other words, you need to bring their perception up to your selling price instead of dropping your selling price to their perception. That's an important thing to understand. Easier said than done, I understand, but you have to do that. The words you use, the descriptive processes are all important in making that happen. So when we talk about performance apparel, we're not talking about dance wear, 
performance apparel is something that breathes, it's longer lasting, and if you sublimate it, it won't fade when you wash it. It will not crack, it will not peel. If you've ever had a screen printed shirt, no offense to the screen printers, okay, but any type of surface application, when you wear the shirt, you're stretching, when you wash it and dry it, it's stretching, and that surface application doesn't necessarily stretch with it, eventually it begins to peel off, okay? and it definitely will fade. Any of the pigment inks are gonna fade. Sublimation doesn't. So that's adding the value. That's important to know as we go through all of this. Okay, so the challenges of apparel sublimation. Sounds easy, looks easy, but there are some challenges and we're gonna address those as we go here. Number one is fabric color. Number two is fiber content. And number three is transfer lines. You're gonna know all about transfer lines and work through with you today. And hopefully, you're gonna walk away able to not have transfer lines. That's our goal. Okay, so let's look at the standard production process. If we just take sublimation, just go jump it and do it on a shirt, what's gonna happen? How's it look, okay? Pretty simple process, similar to what you've done with other products so far this morning. We're gonna take our shirt, we're gonna put it on the lower plat in there, we're gonna smooth things out, okay? Get it ready, pretty quick and easy. Lint roller, very important. Anytime we're working with sublimation, excuse me, let's say polyester instead of sublimation. When you're working with polyester products, in the manufacturing process, there's all kinds of little teeny tiny pieces of fiber that may be left behind. And you may not be able to see it with the naked eye. When you use a lint roller like this, okay, it sticks to stuff, but when you use your lint roller like this, it's gonna pick up those little specks. Don't worry, if you forgot to do it, you'll be able to see the specs when you get done with the pressing because there'll be blue little dots all over, okay? So um, if you've missed any of that, you'll be able to find it later. Unfortunately, it's too late because once it's done, it's done. So that's a very important aspect, okay? So then what we want to do is we want to spray the transfer with a textile spray adhesive. Um, very, very light, but have you ever, did you talk about ghosting? No. Nope. Okay, ghosting. Let me tell you what ghosting is real quick. Some of you know, I can see the look on your face. But ghosting occurs, and you see sublimation is a unique process. Remember, it's a gas process. We heat up those inks and they turn into a gas, and then the gas transfers from the paper into what we're decorating, okay? Since there's a gas involved, we actually got sort of a little bit of free flow there um, going from one surface to the other. So if that transfer paper moves or shifts during the pressing phase, it will give you a sort of a false image along the edges, almost like a little ghost, and that's why we call it ghosting. It's just a real light little um, thing that shouldn't be there, for lack of a better description. Now, it can't shift when we have the heat press down. The only time it shifts is when we open the heat press. So opening the heat press actually causes a bit of a vacuum effect. Now, on this particular press, the swing away, when we bring it straight up, it has a tendency to maybe want to lift the paper and drop it back down. Not that dramatic but it may lift it a little bit and drop it back down. If you've got a uh, clamshell press, which is gonna open like this, you have a tendency to lift one end of the paper and then it drops back down, okay? And uh, so if we're using some type of adhesive, and we can use a basic textile type of adhesive, like this one, okay, that JDS carries, uh, it's gonna hold the transfer in place, but it's not permanent, okay? It just lightly holds, and guess what? It doesn't affect the sublimation. That one shocked me the first time I ever did it. Now, if you're trying to use trans the heat tape, with a transfer on a shirt, bad idea. Okay, it's very aggravating. It can be done, it's just aggravating. So we wanna use that, hold it in place, and then we're gonna go do you know, our wonderful setup, a liner transfer sheet, put our um, Teflon or newsprint. I actually use newsprint more than I do Teflon uh, for that. You know, moisture is, is a very dangerous aspect in sublimation because if you have any moisture in something and then you apply 400 degrees Fahrenheit to it, what does that moisture turn into? Steam. steam. And if it actually turns into steam, it can psh, cause the uh, sublimation to kind of explode out just a little bit. So it ends up like, little, like permanent little droplets in there. So, you know, over time, nothing wrong with um, Teflon, but you gotta be careful. Teflon doesn't absorb moisture and it can actually have moisture build up on the surface and transfer over. So, Newsprint's nice because it'll actually pull moisture away from things. That's why I like newsprint more than I do Teflon. Okay, so we're gonna set up our pressing parameters. Now, one of the things I find with new sublimators is, you know, they sit down and they listen to people like us, give them the standard parameters. And then they're like this, well, we can't change it because that's the recipe they gave us. So they'll go put in 60 seconds, medium pressure, 
400 degrees, because nobody really knows what 40 PSI is, so we say medium pressure, all right? And then it go apply. You know, that works on most of your hard surfaces without much problem at all. A few variances, depending on what we're working on, like with ceramics, we usually go a little bit longer. But if we go and put that onto shirts, in theory, it's going to give us what we want, but the reality is we may end up with something else. Hopefully it looks like this, but there's a good chance that when you look a little closer, you run into something called transfer lines, okay? And there's nothing worse than having transfer lines. Do you know how to get rid of transfer lines? Yeah. Well, no, no. How do you get rid of transfer line once it's on there? Yeah, thank you. New shirt. You find the <laughs> circular file and you drop it in there, okay? Um, it doesn't go away. Now, the re one of the reasons I asked about it, embroiderers, embroiderers have seen hoop lines before. Hoop lines you can get rid of with steam. Uh, they'll actually wash away. There's a couple of ways to get rid of hoop lines. And I'm not going to teach embroidery today, but there is a difference between a hoop burn and a hoop mark, okay? But we'll leave it at that. But you've seen those lines that you can get rid of. You can't get rid of a transfer line because it's actually a partial melting that took place. So here's a good example of what you don't want to see. It looks good there, but now on this when we zoom in a little bit, and you can see it pretty good. This was one of those mistakes I had to work hard to create, okay? But um, you can see that the line there is where the transfer paper made contact. And what happened was some of the polyfibers melted. That's why it's a permanent line. It will not go away. Now, unless you can give us a convince the customer, and I'm a good fast talker, okay? Look, this is the brand new effect I just created. It's called the picture frame look, okay? This is gonna look great on your, you know, it looks good, you know, it's different. It makes you stand out from everybody else, okay? Unless you can convince them of that, you're in trouble because that's not what you wanna have. So the, reason, the way to get rid of these things is to um, understand what causes them and then start working with them, okay? Even though most polyester will withstand 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it's still close to its melting point. And this is a melting situation. Those numbers that we usually use on our time, temperature, and pressure, um, our standard settings may not really apply here. So the very first thing is, can we reduce the amount of heat and the time that that heat is being exposed? Now, because sublimation is a chemical process, when you start decreasing the heat and the pressure, and the time, at a certain point, your color clarity starts to diminish. It'll actually won't look as nice because you didn't get full transfer of color. So it's not like you can just randomly set any value that you want. We recommend that you work in smaller increments, okay, at five degrees at a time, five to 10 degrees at the most, and you really can't go but so low. I mean, about the lowest you really can go and be satisfactory is somewhere around 380 degrees. Getting much lower than that, you really start to lose some of your color. But it's okay to experiment, that's my point, okay? Even though when people will tell you standards, it's okay to experiment a little bit. And I recommend that you do small little steps in your experimentation. Now, with our transfer sheet that comes out of the printer, we have that nice square rectangle edge, okay? It's a pretty sharp edge. You know, you've ever paper cut? Okay, you know about sharp edges, right? Well, there's different ways around it. I mean, one little cheat way to do this, and it doesn't work that great, but I mean, I've done it before because what happens if you're not careful, you get the transfer line in the shape of the edge of the paper. But softening the edges of the paper like this means that there's a softer edge and there's less likelihood of having that embedded transfer line. I don't really like that process. I show it because people always bring it up because then I gotta sit there and tear this stinking thing before I go to do it. And ultimately when I'm tearing something, okay, if it, I'm gonna use one of your instruction sheets. If I was tearing it around this little, the little you know, character here, I would end up tearing it right through his head. Okay, so I don't like the idea of trying to tear the edges. I mean, you are softening the edges, but it's kind of aggravating to do it, okay? I think it's far better to use another option or two. Well, the simple option, and we'll talk about the other option in a minute. Okay, most of you are probably working with a smaller heat press, such as something in this size range, and a desktop printer, something like this. So we have very um, controlled parameters for the size of what we can do. So for those of us using the desktop system, we're probably gonna use something called foam. And this is a high temperature foam. Don't expect the foam that you go buy for you know, window stripping and everything at Home Depot to necessarily work for you. Uh, JDS carries the kit and Vapor actually manufactures this kit. So the phone production process, we're going to take a quick look at, and I want you to keep something in mind as we go. Um, so far, what we're talking about is Vapor apparel shirts. 
I'm, I'm not the sales rep for Vapor Apparel, but it's every um, fabric that we work with, every manufacturer, it's a little bit different. The numbers that we look at here are for Vapor Apparel. There are other companies that make suitable products in the way of uh, apparel that can be sublimated, but the parameters may be different with those companies. One of the things that we're finding is suddenly there's been this big uptick in polyester garments for sublimation. You walk into a trade show and you'll see, you know, a couple of dozen suppliers now saying, oh, well, we got polyester shirts that are perfect for sublimation. Be careful of that. When someone says, my shirt's perfect for sublimation, you need to say, A, show me some things you've done. B, what are your parameters for doing this? And C, do you have somebody on staff who can help me troubleshoot if I have problems? If they can answer yes to all three questions, they probably got a good product. But you got to be careful. A lot of people just realize that they have a polyester shirt by virtue of it being polyester, and they read in Impressions Magazine that sublimation works ideally with polyester. So they're trying to market their shirt, but it's never been tested. Because what we found at Sawgrass, through a lot of our own testing, is some of the different fabrics have different coatings that affect the sublimation, can affect the color, as you found out. Uh, like antimicrobial coatings, in some cases, can block the transfer of sublimation properly into the cells on the garment. So you don't want to just assume that a polyester a garment is going to sublimate well. You do need to test it okay, before you go out and sell it. So what I'm showing you right now applies to vapor. I've used the same process on some other brands with some minor adjustments, okay? And maybe in the temperature and whatnot. And then we're going to demonstrate this live for you in just a minute. I just wanted to walk you through to see the process. Okay, what we want to do is ultimately create a foam pad, okay? And the idea of the foam pad is to soften where the paper makes contact with the garment because it's the edges of the paper, the transfer paper, that are causing the problem. So we're going to find a way to try and soften that up. Now, this isn't pretty, and that's okay. It's a, this is okay. I'm defending you. This is okay to cut something like this, okay? He, he never could draw in the lines when he was in school, okay? So this is what you get. All right. So, but this, no, but really, really, this is okay. Comes in my speak sheet, and the key here is that the transfer sheet itself needs to be larger than the foam, okay? But... The design part needs to be smaller than the phone. So let's say that another way around. This right here needs to be larger than the design image, but smaller than the paper. Now, we can reuse it, too. Don't think this is just a one-shot deal. We can reuse it. We can save it. We can get a couple of hundred pressings out of it before it starts to look really flat, and then, we're, you know, then we want to throw it away. So we, what I've done here is I've taken my transfer paper, and I took my little Sharpie, and I actually just traced the edge. And then I did a little bit of math because it's got to be smaller than the paper, and so I wanted to make it about a half inch shorter on all four sides, and I just did some math so I could cut out my square. And I cut out my square, and I verified that it is smaller than my paper. Doesn't have to be pretty. Yes? Yeah, they're written instructions for this. And if not, I'll come to your house and I'll repeat it for you. Or not. Okay. How good are your instructions? Great. Well, okay. It's online. You can do a video. So it's online. Watch the video. Yeah, it's online. It's in the video. I mean, yeah. No. Oh. Don't worry about it. We, we have it online. We got it in Sawgrass videos. We got it. We got it all that. Okay. Doesn't have to be pretty. One key thing though is that we do need to bevel the edge, and so you can barely see it here, but um, the edges are beveled. And this will be the top. This will go on the platen. This is where the shirt goes. You need a beveled edge around here. Again, you're just doing it with the scissors, and it looks horrible, but it works. Okay, trust me. Okay, we got the beveled edge, and now, this is probably the most important part of all. When I was talking about time, temperature, and pressure settings, and you hear a lot of times 40 PSI is your ultimate setting. What the heck is 40 PSI if you don't have a gauge on there? And also, that's the wrong setting for shirts. But how do you know what the right pressure is other than experimentation? The neatest thing about the foam is you can get a visual representation of the proper amount of pressure to set the heat press at. You can see here I have a heat press locked down, and it's compressing the foam to about half of its original height. About half of the original height is what it's compressing it to. Now, I want you to think about what that means, because if I didn't have anything in here at all, see, this, we actually got the foam and everything in there right now, but if there was nothing sitting in this press, the top and bottom wouldn't even touch when I close it. That's how light the pressure is. And a lot of people, they're used to, you know, especially guys, they're used to more pressure is better, okay? Not with shirts. Very, very light pressure. That's how we set up our heat press. That's our visual reference. 
That's one of the things I really like about the foam. It gives me a nice pressure setting there. Okay, place the foam on the platen with the bevel side up, and then we lay a piece of Teflon typically over it. And, you know, you're thinking, well, yeah, you covered it up. How do you see the edges? You trust me, you can see them. Once you lay the shirt on there, you can see. I didn't, that's not Photoshop, man. You can clearly see where that foam is. And if you're going to do a lot of these, go ahead and tape the foam in place, okay? Otherwise, every time you put a new shirt on, you're going to be moving foam around. You can go ahead and tape it in uh, so that it doesn't move around. And you can see the line up there, and you can feel the line up. And then you can lay, ah, uh, i got to use that first, our lint roller. And then we lay our, we do our spray. It's going to catch up to me in a minute. And then we lay our transfer on the shirt. There, cover it up. Got it right. Uh, and then we put Teflon or whatever on it. And then we go press it. Now, typically, too, again, with the vapor, we drop the pressure to about 380 degrees. We're running about 35 to 45 seconds. And our pressure setting is as per compression. Okay? It's as per how we compress that. So we really cut our time almost in half. But you got to be careful because now we're at a boundary where we may not get complete color transfer. So you got to realize that you can't just go on and on and on changing things around. And different brands will use different settings. Similar, but different. So you have to experiment a little bit with that, see what's going on with that. Okay, a couple more things, and then we'll do a little demo for you. So I've been saying on and on and on about how we can only do polyester with sublimation. And that's true, it only bonds with polyester, Okay. But from time to time, people want 50-50 or 80-20 shirts. Does that work? Yes, it does, because it has polyester in it. Does it work the same as 100% polyester? No, it doesn't, okay? But I'm going to pass some shirts to give you an example. This first shirt, which is no longer manufactured, that's why I cut the tag out, because everybody wants to know where to get this shirt. Okay, this shirt actually has a cotton lining in it, but the surface is 100% poly. So when you feel it, you're going to think, that ain't poly. It is. Okay, here's the initial design, and it's sublimated on 100% polyester. Okay, and it's been washed and everything else. It doesn't wash out, okay, so it doesn't change. Now I took the exact same design and I sublimated it on a 50-50 shirt. So here's the 50-50, and I'll hold them up both together in just a minute, and I'll pass them around so you can see them. But you can obviously say that that probably looks a little bit faded, especially when I hold this one up. And guess what? Look at the difference, okay? So which one is it that's polyester, in case you can't tell? All right. So the reality is I can do it, but I'm going to get a faded look, okay? But there's two parts to the fading. First of all, when it comes right off of the heat press, it, um, it usually looks a little darker than it's going to be because some of this ink thinks it sticks to cotton right up to the point that it goes in the washing machine. And then it doesn't, then that washes off. So what comes off the heat press may be a little bit darker, then what, and it's hard to see this until you have them in your hand, but I'll pass around, you can look in your and, and, and see them. Not much difference, just a little bit. The one that says W5 on the label has been washed five times. So when you're looking at these, that's an easy way to tell, which one did you wash? It says W5 up there on the label. Um, when I washed it, I see a little bit of fading the first time, but I never saw it after the first time, because what it did was we got rid of the ink that had attached itself to the cotton, and the rest was in the poly. So you know what, I mean, it looks kind of washed out, but maybe that's the look you want. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that if that's the look you're looking for. Now, if you're trying to put a picture of grandma on the shirt, that's bad, okay? Because I don't know what kind of message that's going to give, but that's probably not a good thing. We want to use a polyester shirt for that. So, yeah, we can do it on the blended fabrics, okay? Um, and then, see, I have to do that when I do webinars because I don't have the shirt. You can't see the shirts on webinar. And then what about colored fabric? You know, because you've long been told that sublimation only works on white. White is the best color. It's the best color for anything that you do, not just sublimation. Um, if I'm doing um, <coughs> cotton printing, using a cotton pigment ink, white's the best color to print on. If I am printing on paper, okay, with my Hewlett Packard inkjet printer, white is the best color to print on. In fact, very few print systems um, are designed to do anything but white. Take any beautiful color image you have at home, print it out on a piece of yellow paper and a piece of white paper and tell me which one looks better, okay? Obviously, the one that white. White is the best color. We can get the best color clarity. Also, with sublimation, if you don't know it by now, there is no way to reproduce the color white with sublimation because sublimation is the blending of four to eight colors, depending on what type of printer you have, for um, basic colors to create any one of about a million different colors. However, there is no mixture of colors that you can blend together to create the color of white. 
If you don't believe me, I'll get you a box of crayons. And we'll let you draw on the corner until the end of the day. And then you show me if you can create white. Okay? It's not going to happen. So it's not going to happen here either. When we start talking about shirts, so we need to have white ink. For example, if I, wanna, if I needed the, um, the, let's see, if I needed a surfboard on this shirt to be white, it's not going to happen with sublimation, okay? Because I can't produce that color. But what we normally do, and this is what our art, this is what our actual software for our graphics thinks too. Our software graphics assume that you don't have the ability to make white because what colors are you blending together? If you look at colors on a color chart and they have RGB settings, what three colors in RGB can blend to make white? You know, it's not going to happen. You have to have white in a channel. White has to be manufactured. Okay, if you see white fabric, it was bleached. That's how they got the color. If you see white thread, it was bleached. Okay, in the processes of screen printing and direct garment printing, they've manufactured a white ink to be able to use. Sublimation, we don't have that ability because sublimation is a gas format and it has to actually go inside the fiber. So white ink is just not going to happen. So when we go to light colors, we can sublimate light colors without much problem at all. There's a couple of shirts hanging up there on the rack. Uh, the one I passed around, it feels like cotton, that was a light color. Uh, but as we go into darker colors, we run into problems because sublimation is also, being a dye, it's translucent. So the background color has an effect. And the general rule is the sublimation colors must be significantly darker than the background color. You can actually sublimate on a black shirt. You just can't see it because <laughs> it disappears into the background, okay? So that's, you know, that's where the limitation becomes. So light colors are pretty decent. Dark colors... You know, if you do like a red shirt with black ink, you, that'll work. But when you start trying to put light colors on a red shirt, it's not going to look right at all. Um, but again, I've gone and not only here did I do a colored shirt, but this is also a blended shirt. So I took the both um, elements, um, a, a non-poly, or as a 50-50, and a colored shirt. And so this design to me, I actually designed the design to go on to a shirt of this color. And I wanted that faded look to so go into a surf shop. And this looks pretty good as a faded look. And you'll get to see all these shirts. So I'm going to pass them around in just a second. You know, here's that same design put on this particular one again. Works out well. I didn't need the color white. I'm fine putting it on a color background. So that works out. You saw all those, didn't you? And then he's sitting there, so he didn't get to see them because I keep skipping you and whatever. <laughs> okay. Just some other different colors there. So, yeah, we can do some colors. Um, but we don't have the whiting, okay? That's an important aspect. Now, talking about the dark fabric, I just want to show you how that works real quick. Uh, when we're talking about dark fabrics and we're talking about the whiting, okay? In the world of screen printing, the screen printers figured out along, they get the same problem. They start trying to put colored ink on a black background. It's just not going to show up properly. So screen printers figured out a method of being able to put down a base coat of a special engineered ink, a white ink, okay? If you're a screen printer, don't laugh at me because I'm trying to make this really elementary and easy, okay? But if they're going to go on a dark shirt, they typically put a white base first, and they're using a special white ink. They put it down, and then they apply heat to it to cure it using something called a flash cure. And it'll cure enough that they can put all the other colors on top. Not all at once. It's put down in layers, but that's where I simplified it. Now, two important things here. Number one, we got a white base coat, and you notice that it's the same... Um, exact shape and size of the design because it's going to support everything but be covered up at the same time. So it's the same contours. This gives us a white background so other colors pop out, number one. And number two, everywhere else that we actually have white was left open in the artwork so that the white shows through from behind. So when you're creating artwork in Corel Draw, Photoshop, whatnot, areas that you designate as white, when it goes to print, they're left open so the background color shines through. So the background color is red, suddenly your white areas aren't uh, you know, white anymore. Now, screen printers are cheating, okay? Screen printers want you to think that they're printing on black. No, they print it on white. Remember, they put a white coat down and then print it on top. That's cheating, okay? In the world of direct-to-garment printing, they try to do the same thing with those printers that have white ink, is they put down a base. Now, their problem is they can't use heat to cure it, so they use a two-part process. Number one, they've engineered the inks to dry really quick, and because it has to be a lot thinner. If you ever look at screen printing ink, it looks like pudding, okay? If you go look at DTG ink, it doesn't look like pudding. Um, so number one, it has to be thin to get through the heads, but it has to be quick drying. And number two, they'll put down a, a, a pre-treatment that's a chemical catalyst to tell that white ink when it hits that chemical catalyst, you need to cure as quick as you can because more ink's coming down the road. 
So you'll hear a lot of horror stories um, about certain brands of printers that have a lot of white ink issues because the white ink was not maintained properly and it dried in the head and it hardened the head and it cost them $800 to fix it, okay? So when you're out there, if you're looking at other systems, white ink is a bit of a challenge out there, okay? For our purposes, and it, does, it showed up pretty good on there, everywhere that's white when we sublimate is left open so the background comes through. Now, I'm a guy who believes in identifying weaknesses and turning them into strong points. Use them as marketing points wherever you can, okay? So if you look over here at the Eagles, now think about this because we're in the South. Okay, now your South's a little different from my South, but we're still in the South. Now, if I was to put that on a red shirt, the Eagle would be have a red neck. Now, do you see where I'm going with this? Now, in North Carolina and in South Carolina, that would sell good because I would put it on there and the white areas are being left open on a red shirt would shine through and I can say, listen to that, man, I got you a redneck eagle shirt and I probably could sell a ton of them, okay? So that's marketing, all right? Take that weakness, turn it into a strong point. All right. Okay, now, taking it a step further though, um, when we talk about sublimation in general, the majority of what people sublimate really are, are non-apparel items. And those non-apparel items, the majority of them, for sure, come already in the color white. And it's not such a big deal, number one. We already got white. And number two, most of what we do with sublimation, oops, I jumped ahead, is what we call full bleed. Let's say this is, that could be anything. It could be a plaque. It could be a mouse pad. You get it from JDS. You open up your package, and it's white, okay? When I go to put my image on there, the image covers the entire surface such that I recolor the surface. So I didn't get a black plaque and put the wolf on there. I made the background color black as part of the image. So I recolored the entire surface to be the final color that I needed. So if I needed to get a red plaque, you know, um, I was able to do that. Seems like I had a red plaque in here somewhere. See, that's why I hate these things. See, that was a white mouse pad. It was not a red mouse pad, okay? And, you know, we just applied and recolored the entire thing. So as long as we're working with smaller substrates that are smaller than our heat press and our printer, we don't have this issue. This is really only an issue, the thing about being able to sublimate on color. We, we did a big run of um, tote bags from Eat Conscious, I think is the name of the company. And uh, what we actually did, because it would bleed through, and we were doing both sides, is we actually put two sheets of paper inside, we pressed one side, and, and then we just stacked them up, and then we went to do the, the other side. Uh, what we did was we pulled out one of those sheets because it had gone through enough that it got on that first sheet, right. and we didn't want to get on the second sheet inside. So there was two pieces of paper when we did the front side, and then before we did the back side, we pulled one of those sheets out, the one that was directly behind the front side, leaving one behind. Um, there's, there's all kinds of things to learn yeah. as you're doing this, and you don't always know this before you do it, but uh, when you're in production, you learn pretty quickly. I mean, you know, you'll scrub one or two, and um, then you learn from that. Or you'll say, let's call, and we'll try to answer questions. Or we have done this in our shop for many years. So. When the stack of rejects is higher than the stack of um, acceptable ones, yes. you definitely want to stop. <laughs> Actually, really, you know what? The first time you have a problem, don't be afraid to stop and call. Because every time you trash something, you're losing money and you're losing time. And it's, you know, it, it's... We'll say it's okay to trash them, it's not, but it is. But what's not okay is to continue to make the same mistake and not stop and you know, get some help do some troubleshooting. So, so keep that in mind. Press, you just get a shirt, so I mean, production. You can do it a lot faster, or we're just kind of dragging it yeah, out. Well, my question is, should you, how long should you wait between that next shirt for that calibration of the heat? I mean, is there any new problem? It, it's sitting right now, we had it set at 380, and you know, it's always changing a little bit. It's, it's, it's at 380 right now, so I mean. It didn't drop much, not on a good heat press. No, I'm serious. I mean, a good quality heat press will recover pretty quick. A, a, a cheaper one will just, you know, um, I don't know if he talked a whole lot about heat press. Okay, so, you know, it makes a difference. I mean, one thing I tell people is a lot of people have the heat press because their first thing they did was they, they did vinyl letters from like stalls and Dalco, where they're just putting letters and numbers on things. You know what, plus or minus 20, 30, 40 degrees, it's not a big deal. But when you get into sublimation, since it's part of the actual process, the temperature, it makes a huge difference, you know, between those El Cheapos and a good quality one. So, yeah, you can keep it going. I mean, unless you're outside in an igloo, it, it's not going to drop that much. I don't know where you live. Maybe it does. But, we uh, know our, our 
production indoors, so we're pretty. Yeah, I'll bet you do. <laughs> Well, a lot of people use unheated garages. That's where I was thinking of. I guess they don't have unheated garages where you live. Uh, yeah, those are called freezers. Okay. So. What if you did front and back? Will that? Well, don't do back to back. I mean, normally you do is you do all your fronts and do all your backs. When you reheat the front up. It it depends on the quality of the shirt. I mean, the shirt I've used the most is the the vapor shirts, and and I've been able to do it without any problem. Um, I, you know, I've done front and back and I had a problem, but there's some of these other quality shirts that just bleed through pretty bad. Again, put something in between if you're worried about it, but you know, you're under there for 30 seconds and there's usually enough barrier, especially if you put some extra paper in there, that doesn't affect the front. Um, I can, we can actually do the other side of that shirt if you like. Cool. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, I went and said that, you know, screw it up and I'll get blamed. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> he still got hair. <laughs> Now I'm going to put a piece of scratch paper barrier on top of my foam because the back side of the original image may transfer a little bit onto my foam. What's that? You'll see it on the next shirt. Yeah, right. Special effects training, man. Yeah. Which, again... Set yourself apart from the competition. Sometimes I have to learn things the hard way. Yes. Yeah, custom ghosting. Now, this is going to be a little bit more difficult to feel the foam through this, but we can still do it. I didn't loop roll that, so I could have some. There's a lot of here, but I'm not, I'm not making a lift or anything. Show us what we do. Yeah, do as I say, not as I do. Um, the other thing that we might have time for is uh, going over some of the color matching issues that we talked about earlier. Um, I've got <laughs> 2 o'clock. What do we got? And was my watch right? Well, I got five o'clock. This one's your one. Five minutes. Five minutes slow. Right. You know, no, let me tell you something. Now, every time I come to Texas, I kid you not, the, te the time between where I live in North Carolina and here is an hour and five minutes different. <laughs> I've been coming to Texas for years doing shows and stuff. So and every time I come, it's an hour and five minutes different. It's long That's <laughs> what it is. So is, that, is somebody slow? Is that what's happening? Or? I didn't say anything on the slide. <laughs> the pack would be deadly to say, but I'm just saying, okay. you know, it's not my watch. My computer says it's uh, the one that's supplemented. <laughs> Man, you almost lined this head up. I did, slides, almost. Okay, so now I turn this inside out. You should be able to see there's very little transfer that went through either side. So the only thing that's keeping it from bleeding into the other side is the pressure and the type of shirt? Mostly the time. Um, because if you left it in, if I left this in for a minute and a half to two minutes, it would definitely go all the way through the shirt. Okay. Yep. Yep. Just so you can see, this was the paper underneath. So the front of the shirt still had enough heat that it transferred a little bit into the paper. So that's why we use the paper. And that's why we don't reuse the paper. So that we don't have that problem. We can do a lot of paper. Um, I don't know who was first. I'm so you can rob color from the front side of the shirt. Yeah. Well, Actually, a tiny bit, yes. But, but you're only going to do it once. But if you look at the shirt, you would not be able to tell. You want it to go on both sides? It's not gonna. It won't bleed so much that it's gonna be a great image on the other side. Yeah. It'll just you'll see it. <clears throat> now I've done some car flags, but they're I mean, and it's two sided like the bandana, but much thicker. I mean, they were made for it, and it was two layers that were actually sewn together. They cheated, but it, there's no way to 
put anything in between them, but it was thick enough that it didn't bleed through other than maybe a little bit on the paper like that. I just think it looks better than having a complete white yeah. side. I agree, but uh, you know, I couldn't tell you to try on that. Again, there, there's some different shirts out there that would just bleed horribly. Um, I'm not supposed to say what runs they are because you know, that's like I get sued or something, but um, you can find that out for yourself. <laughs> a little experimentation. So definitely shirts aren't created equally and they have a big deal a big effect on how much it's going to bleed through or not. Um, there's lots of different things you can do. I mean, there's, you can experiment all you want on that to see what you're going to do. I mean, you know, if you were taking, for example, that bandana, I mean, the first time you, go ahead and decide that you're going to destroy a few of them and then play with the settings because, like I say, by dropping down the pressure, that doesn't force it through quite as much, but you may not get the color transfer as much either. I mean, it's normal when we actually take the transfer of paper off that, it's, that it didn't all transfer. And don't think that that has to. You're never going to find a transfer sheet that's invisible that all the ink transfer. It just doesn't happen. I've seen people worry themselves to death over that. You know, scorched shirts and everything else trying to make it. That's just the way it's going to be. Uh, but the experiment to find out what's best for that bandana and then write it all down. And, you know, having something to help measure parameters like foam because you can, you know, you can visually see how much you compress that foam. That helps you a whole lot to figure out what's the right thing to do. Uh, Norma had a question. She was wondering how we do the scarves. And there's a scarf back there that's probably like, I don't know, 40 inches long. You told me you bought that at Macy's. I think it's six. Well, it, that's what it has to look like. But it's been personalized. The thing about doing those kind of uh, objects is you, need a, you do need a large press if you want to do it all in one shot. But if you, want, if you just have a small press and you're piecing it together, that scarf, uh, you have to be careful because things are going to overlap and you're going to see where they overlap. Or even if they're butted up against each other, you'll see where they butted up against each other. Choose a design that doesn't matter. Yes, you got to kind of work that into the design so that it does not matter. And that's kind of the same way with the shirts that Jimmy was saying, but the design can compensate for the limitations that you have with your heat press. So even if you have a, a scarf that's 60 inches long and your printer can only do 14 inches, Maybe just do a design that incorporates that you know that area and the rest of it can be blank, or you can try to do it in segments, contract leaving some sort of margin in between. Or contract uh, but yeah, doing a whole piece that way with a small format printer is difficult because you would see the overlaps. Yep. yep. And you re do another image over like where they have the baby, say mom and dad, so they want their pictures up on each side of that. Can you resolve oh, it? Every time you resublimate something that already has the image on it, it starts to degrade uh, because it's degassing now, and you're, <coughs> and you're losing some of that ink that was already on there. So once it reaches that temperature again, you start to lose that. So yes, and no. I mean, yeah, not recommended. Right. Right. Couldn't do that in the graphics part though. I'm sorry. Take it from a picture and put it in your graphics and put it in there. Sure. Yeah. That's where you. Get Be careful that wherever you spray it, the residue will be all right. Oh, yeah. Wherever you are. Yeah. You ever see Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase? Mm -hmm. After he cuts down that big tree and he's lying in bed trying to read the newspaper and he has hands and all that sap and everything he's trying to read stuck all over his fingers, same kind of concept there, man. It, but you're right, it gets everywhere. In fact, if you're doing it a lot, what we did was make just like a, we got like a big cardboard box and we would actually put stuff in the box and spray it in there just to kind of contain the spray from going everywhere. Because eventually it's on the floor, it's every, and then it attracts dust and dirt and lint, and it's uh, that's a good point. You got to be careful with that. Okay, that too. Okay, did you want to do something on color management? You were saying. I mean, okay, I'll leave you some time. Okay, well, we're going to switch gears. If you need to take a, a quick um, uh, restroom break because you did eat lunch and probably consumed liquids. Um, you're welcome to do that. We'll take maybe but just about a five minute break. I'm going to switch PowerPoints and we're going to go in and talk about the really fun stuff sales and marketing, all that kind of stuff. Making money things. So, about 10 minutes.